Jerry Maguire jacked up our theology on marriages. <laughs> Another person does not complete you. But that's what we started doing. We started looking for movie marriages instead of biblical marriages. Apparently, we end up believing that we're a 50% person and somebody else is a 50% person and we come together to make a whole person. And that is nonsense. What we need in relationships is two whole people coming together and getting on with kingdom business. of you have ever wondered what pastors do? <laughs> just a just show of hands. Uh, a couple of you. Go, like, let's just be honest. Have you ever just thought, like, what do they do week to week? Show of hands. Where, where are you at? Where are you at? A lot, lot of you. Um, just for clarity's sake, we, um, we work more than one day a week, okay? Um, and uh, contrary to popular opinion, uh, we don't golf as much as people think that we golf. And uh, is anybody thankful for the pastoral team around here at the well? Come on. We've got, we've got pastors running around everywhere right now. They're doing uh, 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 work in baptisms right now, and later this afternoon, our pastors are going to be working in our welcome home class, and uh, during the week, our pastors are counseling people. They're working through group situations, class situations. Um, our church right now, due to the culture and the society that we live in, um, if you've been here for any length of time, our, our pastoral team specifically and those who communicate are working really hard right now to create and... Um, uh, maintain a biblically faithful and healthy church uh, to create biblical, um, biblical acumen and help us understand scripture more. And so these things take great degrees of work. We counsel people and uh, we work. This is what I say, uh, uh, pastoral ministry, if you don't know, and this is not to like toot our horns. I'm going to use this in a second, all right? But pastoral ministry, if you don't know, um, is, is schizophrenic in many ways. Um, and we say it like this, uh, pastors, we are in the highest moments of people's lives and the lowest of people's lives. You guys don't need us when it's just fine, yeah. <laughs> right? You're just kind of cruising through life and everything's all right, but you, we get a call when things are really bad or when things are really good. And so on any given day, uh, what we can do is we can go from one meeting where we just had the greatest meeting with somebody and there's so much life and faith and excitement, and then we can go and step into the next meeting and we're trying to moderate through somebody who just lost a mom to cancer. So like, we're constantly just going like this. Paul the Apostle was a pastor. He loved people. Um, he loved people dearly. Sorry, third service. Um, so 1 Corinthians 7 while people have a tendency to look at 1 Corinthians 7 and, and read it with like a, a critical eye of Paul, there's going to be a lot of language in here that we're going to read in just a moment where people are like, yeah, Paul was part of the patriarchy and Paul hated women and all these different things. And like, I just tell you unequivocally, like that's nonsense. It's not true. Um, we're going to read that in just, in just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 1 through to 40 is probably um, one of the most pastoral sections of this letter that you could, that you could read. Because he's, he's literally answering questions that had been given to him by those who made up the church. Um, we'll read that in just a second. But Paul's work as a pastor is meant to inform people, teach people. He's going to write to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He's going to say all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching and rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So a pastor's job is to equip the church, every single one of us. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through to 16, Paul's going to write, and he's going to tell us that God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And then there's a reason that the church has been given these functions, and it says for the equipping of ministry, for building up, creating unity of faith, knowledge of God's Son, growth and maturity, and growth in every way. And so while I understand that there are different feelings and ideas about pastors and church leaderships uh, in, in a healthy atmosphere and in a, in a God-fearing church, uh, we have healthy pastoral leadership, we have healthy lay leadership, we have a healthy congregation. Can I get an amen in church today? And so there are times when the pastor has to bring challenging truths from, from Scripture. And this is one of those days um, that I'm not seeking or working to be offensive, but how many of you know God's word can offend at times? Yeah. Yeah. There's content in here that, that my job, and I'm just going to, if you're new to our church and you kind of, you know, you've never set foot in a place like this, here's my responsibility as, as the main communicator here, but all of our communicators that teach scripture is my number one first job is to re remain faithful to the text. 
and then caring and considerate of the people that are receiving that text. Does that, does that make sense? And so that's what we're going to try to, to do today. Um, all that to say is that we help people, this is what pastors do, is we help people see their situation in light of God's word and directives, and then we support, we help support in the daily sanctifying task of alignment around those things. In other words, is our job as Christ followers is to day in, day out, constantly find our lives in alignment with his word. Y'all with me still? That's the, that's, the, that's the task of sanctification in our lives. And so for the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul is disciplining the church, as we've dealt with over the past few weeks. But in chapter 7, now through to chapter 16, Paul's going to turn his attention from disciplinary issues to instructional issues. And in this first chapter that we're going to do, chapter 7, he's instructing them in relationship status. So if you're writing notes today, I just want you to write that at the top of your paper. The, the title of today's message is simply that, relationship status. Relationship status. As he continues on, next week we're going to get into chapter 8, um, which is going to be a funky chapter for some of us because he's going to deal with the issue of eating meat that's sacrificed to idols. And you're like, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, come next week and we'll talk about that. Um, it's really about Christian liberty and how do we handle the grace that we have in Christ and the liberty that we have in Christ and how do we create mechanisms and how do we understand ethics and things like that. So that's next week. Then we're going to continue on as we walk through this and Paul's going to deal with the resurrection. He's going to deal with gifts in church, the order of a church service. He's going to deal with giving. He's going to deal with all kinds of different situations uh, interpersonally with people, the exercising of gifts, all of those things. Now he's going to bring instructions. But Chapter 7, most, if not all, theologians and scholars would agree on this fact, that the totality of chapter 7 is given to us because Paul is answering questions that have been written to him from the, from the congregants, if you will, in church. It'd be like you writing a letter to me during the week, and then I answer, well, or an email, and be like, hey, what about this? And then I go, okay, well, let's, let's look at it this way. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. And so what Paul's doing is he's using his understanding, especially the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, his Jewish background, his understanding of Scripture, his understanding of God. He's using that to deal with and answer the, the questions of life that have great nuance for people. Yeah. That's the introduction. That's what's going on in, in chapter 7. Specifically, what Paul wanted is he wanted to make sure in those first six chapters that a foundation was built in the Corinthian church and their, and their declaration connected to it that we are going to try to live our life in alignment with what God has for us, okay? Because he did not want to answer their questions about situations until they understood what their foundation is. How many of you know it's important to have a foundation? Right? And so that was Paul's work, the first six chapters, is lay a foundation. You guys remember when Jesus talks about two types of people? He says there's the person who builds their life on a rock, and there's the person who builds his life on, their, on the sand. Same storm comes, but the response to that storm is different because of how they built their life. Well, this is what Paul was doing, is he was laying a foundation so that he could teach the truths that he was going to teach so that the people in his church would stand. My heart for our church is that no matter what comes our way in these next few weeks, months, years to come, come on somebody, that your life and my life will stand intact because we have it rooted and grounded on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So with that being the case, let's turn our attention to the treatment of, of this text. What was happening uh, at the time that Paul writes to them, specifically this section of scripture? Well, um, Paul had to deal with a church that had some inaccurate views of marriage, singleness, sex, and divorce, and it was being produced by a couple different things. The first reason this was happening is because they had an over-spiritualized understanding of salvation due to outside cultural influence, okay? So some were saying that to be more spiritual or to be deeper, one is to remain single, one is to divorce, and the other treatment that we're going to specifically focus on in this moment is that um, a couple was to stop having sex within the context of their marriage, intimacy. This would have actually represented a popular ascetic philosophy of the day. Many scholars and theologians agree that these people may have represented actually one of the factions that Paul mentioned earlier in the letter. And so here's what's happening. Let's look at a little bit of punctuation really quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. You all still tracking with me today? Okay, and I have to teach like this. We got a lot of academic work before we get, we get personal today. So just let your whatabouts just go to the side for just a second. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 7, verse 1 says, Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is, and then he's going to add quotations. Do you see those quotations? 
And these quotations, what this is representing is a statement that he was putting in his letter back to him. He said, he, in essence, he said, hey, now in response to the thing you wrote about me, and if you don't remember what you wrote to me about, this is it. You said it, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. I don't like the language of that one. Other translations worded out differently. Let's just w- read it from the CSB version um, in a different way. It says, now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations for or with a woman. Verse 2, but because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill the marital duty to his wife and likewise a wife to her husband. Verse 4, a wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does, period. Now, a lot of people just stop right there and I can see some of your faces. You're like, what? (laughs) Just let it sink in for effect for just a second. You're like, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Okay, one, we're talking about marriage right here, so singles back down for a second, okay? But watch what Paul says. Paul's going to, and a lot of people stop there, and a lot of people have propagated this idea. This is where they go, like, see, Paul was a man of the patriarchy. He hated women. Well, that's because you read to verse (laughs) 4. And then you stopped. Okay, this is what he says, right? Um, In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. So he equalizes it. This is where we get the picture of uh, mutuality between husband and wife. Y'all see that? This is really important. Then he says, do not deprive one another except when when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. So he says, I only want you to have abstinence and intimacy between married uh, married people. Uh, Then come together again. Why? Because if you abstain from each other for too long, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people, this, and what is he saying? Not the previous, but what he's getting ready to say. He says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am. What was Paul? He was single and celibate. But each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has, has that. And so here's what was happening, is that the reason he's addressing this issue is because you had couples that were going, well, if we're going to be deeper and more spiritual, we should stop having intimacy between us. And Paul was saying, knock that off. Come on, married couples. <laughs> it should be an amen at church today, all right? <laughs> Everybody's so quiet in church with this stuff. Um, and so he's like, that's not deep. That's not spiritual. Deep and spiritual is actually being intimate with each other and creating health and vibrancy within the context of marriage. Now, I already know the what about, and I'm not going to chase it down too much right now. This is why I'm asking everybody to we'll equalize some things in the backside. This is, not a, this is a carte blanche statement right now, but this is not taking into account where there are situations of abuse, et cetera, et cetera, within the context of marriage. Right now, Paul's assumption is that we're talking about healthy marriages. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I want us to know that I'm not sitting up here today going like, this is just the way that it is, and you just got to have sex with each other all the time. Like, no. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's going to get tweeted. Um, but Paul, Paul, Paul's dealing with the assumption that we're talking about a healthy marriage here. So what he's saying is, don't, don't, don't be trite with this. Don't, don't be stupid with this. There should be intimacy taking place between you as husband and wife. Don't think it's more spiritual to avoid this. That's what he's saying. So that's the first thing that was going on and why we have chapter seven. The second thing that was going on is there's an inaccurate understanding of defilement within a mixed marriage. And what do I mean by mixed marriage? Well, the Corinthian church was predominantly made up of Gentiles, or to use a more historical term, pagans, okay? Which means converts other than Jewish people who had been converted to Christianity. Because of this, the church would have faced the issue of having one person from a marriage be converted to Christ while the other was not. So what was happening is there was talk going around that this would bring defilement to the one who had become a Christian. So therefore, this is what was being said. The popular rhetoric of the day was, well, if you became a follower of Jesus and the other one didn't want to become a follower of Jesus, then just divorce him. That's what was going on. And Paul's like, no, no, hold up a second. Maybe let's not do that right out the gate. Okay. Paul was actually working uh, pastorally to deal with this. We're going to give a lot of treatment to this section for just a second. Y'all ready to go academic for a second? N.T. Wright comments, a great theologian, he says, Paul believed, listen to these words, that holiness could be more powerful than uncleanness. 
something's happened in our modern church especially, but was happening then as well, is that we've come to the conclusion in church life that the, that the spirit of the world is greater than the spirit of God. And we've got to knock that off. Can I just remind us that the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that rose Christ from the grave, lives inside of you and I as we profess faith inside of Him. The world is not a big, bad boogeyman that we're living in. You actually have control in the space that you're in. You actually have a power to thrive in the midst of chaos because of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Come on, somebody. Are we thankful for the Spirit of God? So what they were saying is like, oh, this is like an unclean thing. And Paul's saying, no, it's not. I want you to see what can take place. Okay, so we have to understand that this is what Paul, like the other side of this is Paul was not giving permission for a believer to marry an unbeliever, okay? He wasn't creating that. So let's be very clear about this. Um, To the singles, don't flirt to convert. That's a dangerous path, okay? (laughs) What Paul was trying to deal with is he's saying, hey, there's two people. You've come out of, of paganism, you are, you, as unbelievers, and now you've got one who is deciding to follow Jesus. Don't just jump ship on that marriage. Okay. To examine this deeper, we need to look at the ethic of marriage first. All right? So watch what Paul writes. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 11. To the married, I give this command. Watch what he says. Listen to his words. Not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. We'll get into divorce deeper in our later points, okay? But this is the general ethic that Paul is ascribing to on the issue of divorce. Where is he getting this from? He's getting it from Jesus' teachings. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. Matthew 19, watch what it says. Matthew 5, 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, this is this teaching that Jesus is going to do. I'm going fast to just get information out to you. But this, che- this teaching that Jesus does on divorce is in the same line of teaching when he's, go- when he's doing that. You've heard it was said, and I say unto you, if you've ever read that before. But Jesus would say something like this. You've heard it said that, uh, uh, that uh, to not commit adultery. And then he says, but I say unto you, if you even look at somebody lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus never actually, contrary to popular opinion in our world, Jesus never lowers the standard. He always raises the standard. Right. Come on. So now he's going to say, hey, listen. So he's going to launch into this divorce conversation. Okay? So that's the general ethic. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Dang, Jesus, that's a heavy hand. Let's zoom in on it. Watch chapter 19 of Matthew. Some Pharisees approached him to test him, and they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female, and he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Pause. Every shout, pause. Pause. This is where we get the general ethic of marriage within Christendom. This is our orthodox view. Marriage is between the way that God created it, one man and woman. This is the original intent. Jesus affirms this. This is where we get it from, okay? Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So he gives this ethical uh, conversation about divorce. And then watch this. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers and send her away? Watch what Jesus says. He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But it was not like that from the beginning. Do you see the ideal that Jesus has created? He keeps referencing them back to origination. I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. That is a, that is a strong statement. Now, I need you all to just loosen up really quick and watch how the disciples interact with this moment. This is hilarious to me. His disciples said to him, if the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, it is better to not marry. (laughs) This is what the disciples are saying. If I can't get a divorce, I shouldn't get married. (laughs) That's how they're responding to this. That's insane. So he responded, Jesus responded, it's not, not everyone can accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. He's going to have a conversation about eunuchs. Um, we'll deal with the broader implications of this in a bit, but I want you to see this because uh, Paul has this in mind when he's speaking to the ethical reality of divorce specifically, okay? And as he writes pastorally on the issue of marriage and divorce, okay? He's saying this, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes today, God has an ideal for marriage. 
To say otherwise is avoiding what Scripture says. God has an ideal for marriage. Full stop. But watch what happens then. Going back to what I talked about earlier about pastors and how we work with people, Paul now has to deal with a little bit of situational nuance. Watch what he does. Okay? 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through to 16. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother, because this is one of the questions that came up, watch what happens. If any brother has an unbelieving wife and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. So if we pause there for just a second, this term holy is not taught, it's like, it's not, it's not some magical incantation. What Paul's talking about here is like, you have no idea that possibly you remaining in that marriage instead of jumping ship on it can bring reformation to the other person's life. He's saying, what would it look like if you trusted God more than your relational status? Now, again, his, the thought process going into this is that we have a, for lack of better terms, a healthy relational reality there, okay? So he's not talking about the gross negligence or abuse or these things that are over here on these sides. He's saying if we have a general, good, and healthy, stable marriage, if she wants to stay just because you became a believer, if she wants to stay married, stay married. If he wants to stay married, stay married. This is what Paul's dealing with, and he's pastorally trying to work with them with this ethic. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying that unbelief is not an option for divorce. Okay? Now, I want to tell you a story. I was preaching at a church a couple weeks back, um, and I had the privilege of meeting this couple that was at this church, and I was talking to the wife um, in the lobby afterwards, and she was telling me her story, and part of her story was um, that both of them uh, had come from a... uh, from an addiction type of life. So they were dealing with all kinds of different addiction. And so um, I was talking to her, tell me about that. How's that, you know, how's that worked out? What's going on? And so she said, I just kind of finally hit the wall one day and I decided we're coming to church. And so she came to this church that I was speaking at and she gave her life to Jesus. And uh, she went home, told her husband and they stayed married, but he's like, nope, I want no part of that. And so she came back to the church and the next week came back to church and then started bringing the kids and came back to church and came back to church. A month before I spoke there, both her and her husband were baptized as they've given their life to Jesus. Okay? Why do I say that? Because here's what I want us to see. The ethical teaching that that Paul's dealing with here is he's saying divorce should be the floor, reconciliation should be the ceiling. But some of us, especially in our culture, and we could go through a whole philosophical and history lesson on this thing, but like no-fault divorces, and when they got interjected into society, we could do a whole fun think process through that. But let's just say it like this, black and white statement, um, we've just started throwing divorce around too easy. That's not a shot at anybody, but this is what Paul is saying, is like, hey, in the character of our faith, I wonder what it would look like to persevere a little bit more. So he's saying unbelief is not, is not a thing. Okay, so um, that's the treatment to that issue. Uh, the other thing that was going on, is this all right with everybody if we yeah. teach this way today? We're just working through it. All right, uh, the last one is this, is that there was a lack of assessed dignity concerning various relational statuses other than marriage. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9 says this, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it's better to marry than to burn with desire. (laughs) Paul. (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, So Paul's dealing with this issue right here. He's saying, hey, listen, I want you to to be like I am. And he's like single and happy, rocking it. It's awesome, right? He's like, I'm ministering. We're doing kingdom work. We're cruising. Mission stuff's happening, all kinds of good stuff. But he's like, if you can't be like I am, I want you to get married. And uh, because I don't want that tension of what it is that you're desiring inside of you to pull you away and possibly cause you to to sin. Matthew 19, 10 through 11, his disciples said, if the relationship of a man with a wife is like this, it's better not to marry. He responded, not everyone can accept this saying, but only to those whom it has been given. This is a very important topic in our current society and culture, and especially within the church, okay? Uh, If you study Jesus's words, you will see, here it is, and that's where I'm going to slow down. You will see the dignity of singleness assessed as equal to marriage. And in Paul's eyes, maybe even greater. Here's what I want to say about this. 
Through Paul's teaching, we see that Paul valued effectiveness more than relational status. Paul valued effectiveness more than relational status. Why? Because when you get married, your life is over. <laughs> That's the joke I've been cracking all day long to break the tension in this. Here's, here's what I mean by that. So Paul's idea is this, like, listen, when you get married, uh, when you get married, your, your attention shifts as it should. It's going to shift to a husband. It's going to shift to a wife. It's going to shift to, to little things running around your house, right, eventually. And so he's saying, hey, listen, this is Paul's, Paul's idea is that, and rightfully so, your attention would shift. But he says, I would much rather you be effective for the kingdom than be in relationship with somebody. But Jesus would say, if that's too much for you, then, then you got to make sure, like, that's a calling for some of us. And Paul would say, if it's too much for you, then you got to get married. But here's the thing that I need us to understand. Stop viewing your singleness as a prison sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to say it one more time for the singles in the back. Stop viewing your singleness as a prison sentence. Now, here's the one thing that has an asterisk next to this whole thing, okay? And this is really funny, and I only include this for humor. But if you study Paul's eschatology, his view of the end times... From Jesus to the end time, Paul thought Jesus was coming back next Tuesday. So when he said to everybody, he's like, listen, I would just, mad, I'd just rather you remain single till Jesus comes back, which is like 7.30 next Tuesday. <laughs> so it made sense to them. He's not like in our modern context, Jesus hasn't come back yet. And we don't know when he's coming back. So we have to be very honest about this reality as singles. And like, are you really asking me to remain single till I'm 90? I'll tell you about somebody in just a minute, okay? Um, so, so watch. So that's to the singles. We'll deal with you in uh, a little bit more in just a moment. A couple other things. Chapter 7, 25 through to 38, most, Paul, most uh, scholars and theologians agree that Paul is specifically dealing with those who are betrothed or have an arranged marriage. So we're not going to give any treatment to that today because I don't think there's anybody in here like that. Um, 39 through to 40, verses 39 through to 40, this is an aside to the widows that Paul's going to write to, and he says this, a wife is bound as long as her husband is living, okay? So back to that divorce ethic, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone she wants, only in the Lord. And then he says this, but she is happier if she remains as she is, in my opinion, and I think that I also have the spirit of the Lord, so... <laughs> This is Paul's way of going, like, this is my opinion, and I'm right, because I have the spirit of the Lord. Um... <laughs> So this, 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 I, I say it this way because I want you to see the humanity and the engagement with Paul and, and the people in this church. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so what does this look like if we were to zoom out and kind of just package it all up? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 through to 40 looks like this. To the married, remain married with active intimacy, especially where we have healthy marriages going on. To the unmarried, it's good to remain unmarried. To married believers, remain married in health. Married with an unbeliever, remain married in health. To the betrothed, we're not even talking about it. Widows, you are free to marry or not marry. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through to 40, in a nutshell. Okay? So the question becomes this then, what do we do with all of that? How do we onboard all of this information? And that's what we're going to spend our time doing for the, for the little time that we have left. I'm going to invite Joanna up, um, on the piano, and I'm going to do this not because I need mood music <laughs> um, or because I want to emotionally manipulate anything. I'm not trying to do that. Um, I want you to see what happens to the room. We're in, a, we're in a fairly academic space right now. We're thinking and we're, we're engaged this way. But I want you to see what happens when a worshiper uses their gift. How many of you would you, how many of you, <laughs> bye. <laughs> That's awesome. How many of you would agree with me that when a worshiper uses their gift, it changes the atmosphere of a room? And we move from this academic space, this head space, to a heart space. And the reason that I have her up here is because I want us to assimilate these next few points that I'm going to talk through in a different posture, a posture of worship. Because for some of us today, these are going to hit on different levels and in different ways 
They're going to cause you to think about some stuff, feel some things. So how do we onboard all this information, this entire chapter? What, what do we do with it? Well, here's the first principle. Four principles for Corinthians is this. Principle number one, marriage must be held to a higher standard and treated with sacredness. Church, can I just tell us right now, it is time that we bring our marriages back to holy places. We've got to treat them as holy. I wish my wife was here. She's, she's preaching someplace else today, but... Our marriage isn't perfect, but we treat it holy. So what that means is that I handle it different. Oh, I'm going to say this. I feel the spirit of the Lord on this one. Some of us treat our cars better than our marriages. You'll polish that thing and you'll park it in the DI parking lot so nobody bumps it. Oh my goodness. You've got alarm system after alarm system. You watch that thing multiple times a week. You don't even allow your kids in the car. You get them Cheerios out of here. You'll treat your car better than your marriage. And I just got to say, that's a sad reality that we're dealing with in the church right now. And I don't say that judgmentally, and I don't say that with condemnation. I understand there's reasons that, that we enter into places that our marriages shouldn't, but carte blanche, there's some things that if we just gave it a little bit more effort, if we polished it, if we parked it in a better spot, if we had alarm systems around it, come on somebody, that our marriages as Christ followers could actually be thriving. And here's, here's what's interesting about the subject matter. Instead of appealing to the holiness and the sacredness of the marriage, what many of us do is we try to find excuses for why this should be allowed. But what if we flipped the standard? What if we appealed back to the origination clause? What if we went back to what Jesus has said? This is the original intent that husband and wife be joined together. The two become one. Do you see the unity in that? Do you see the beauty in that thing? Do you see the purpose in that thing? And what does it require? Men, I'm going to talk to you first. It, it requires you owning up to things. Oh, no amens in church today. Okay. <laughs> It means you having a conversation instead of going golfing. It means you getting the porn out of that marriage. It means you walking away from that thing that's starting to bud at the workplace. It means you getting on your hands and knees before the creator and the savior of the world and saying, God, today, give me this day my daily bread. Give me everything that I need to be the husband that you've called me to be, the father that you've called me to be, the leader that you've called me to be, the man that you've called me to be. To be. And for some of us, we will still reject that idea because it seems weird. It's not weird. It's who we've been created to be. And women, I would say the same exact thing to you. It's not a disparity in that light. We have the same exact issues going on. Ladies, we got to drop our pride and our ego we got to drop some of the things that are causing the tension. And here's what I believe about marriages with two Christ followers in it. If we have two people pursuing Jesus in the context of a marriage, divorce shouldn't be an option. Yes. Amen. That's a bold statement, I know. How do I know that? Because 2 Corinthians, Paul says that we've been reconciled to Christ and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Divorce is the floor, but reconciliation is the ceiling. And what I mean by that is God's greatest, greatest joy would to see two people. I mean, there's tons of brokenness. Church, there's not one thing you can come into my office with now. I've been a pastor for a long time, and I say this. There's not one thing that you can come into my office with, and I would be surprised by it. I have seen the gamut of broken humanity. But I can also tell you by experience, I have seen the power of God's faithfulness when humanity is at its worst. So we've got to restore. Marriage must be held to a higher standard and treated with sacredness. Is this all right with everybody today? Um, 
Now, obviously, I'm not talking about where there's abuse and all these other things, extenuating circumstances in marriage. I'm just trying to get us to the ideal for a second. Number two, here's the second way we onboard all of this information, is that singleness and celibacy are legitimate callings from God. One of my favorite authors, and when I say one of my favorite authors, I'm talking top five. He's a theologian by the name of John Stott. Number one book that I've ever read about preaching and communication, God's word. Check this out. He was single and celibate for 90 years before he would pass away. And I say single and celibate. That means he did not have sex. He's considered a statesman and a spokesman for Christianity. And in 2005, Time Magazine ranked Stott among the 100 most influential people in the world. And this is what he writes. He says, in singleness, there's a freedom to devote oneself to ministry and prayer in ways that marriage and family responsibilities might complicate. But neither is superior to the other. Both are gifts from God for different purposes. He held and lived the belief that singleness and celibacy are legitimate callings from God. So to the singles in the house today, look at me in the eyes when I tell you this. Your singleness is not a prison sentence. Live into it. And I would even go so far because a lot of people are like, well, what do you think about this? Can you just give me a straight statement? I'll give you straight statements. I think you should pursue Jesus above all else. Simple as that. Now, hold on. And I'm not talking like weird, like Jesus is my boyfriend. Like that's not what I'm talking about, okay? (laughs) Don't do that. That's weird, okay? And it doesn't work the other way, by the way, okay? Um, What I'm talking about is like, what would it look like if you stopped coming to church looking for a person and started pursuing Jesus? And I'm giving like these idealistic things. And I understand, now, let me back up as your pastor, understand that there's drives inside of us. I understand that, I understand that people uh, that, that you need or want or believe that you need and want companionship and all those different things. But here's, here's what we end up doing is that inherently we end up believing that we're a 50% person and somebody else is a 50% person and we come together to make a whole person. And that is nonsense. What we need in relationships is two whole people coming together and getting on with kingdom business. I'm going to say this. Singles, write this down. Another person does not complete you. Jerry Maguire jacked up our theology on marriages. But that's what we started doing. We started looking for movie marriages instead of biblical marriages. He doesn't complete you. She doesn't complete you. Eric and I talk openly. She does not complete me, and I do not complete her. She doesn't need me to complete her. She needs Jesus to complete her. I don't need her to complete me. I need Jesus to complete me. And then when we have two whole people who have been completed by the one who's made us, then we build this beautiful thing called one flesh. And it's supposed to do things in the world and it's supposed to bring hope and it's supposed to raise kids in the context of a healthy, thriving marriage. That is the ideal that we see in scripture. Now I I understand some of us can't clap because we've experienced the broken side of this. But just because we've experienced the broken side of it doesn't mean that we can't cheer on the idealistic truth of it in Scripture. Principle three. (laughs) Divorce is not an option just because you want an upgrade. (laughs) Some of us weren't ready for church today. Divorce is not an option just because you want an upgrade. I want you to see the power in this, what Jesus is saying. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. So they are no longer two. They are one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, once again, let me be very clear on this. I'm not talking about where there's abuse and sexual immorality. I'm very aware that it's seen emotionally and physically and sexually. I'm not talking about gross negligence in our marriages. But if you read the statistics, like I've been reading the statistics, listen to this, according to a recent Forbes study, you know, that was cited for the number one reason for divorce was just what they viewed as basic incompatibility and money issues are among the top reasons for divorce. And I'm just going to tell you this right now, according to scripture, that's not allowed because those are changeable things. And what is incompatibility? Some of us are looking to marry the exact copy of us. I don't want that. <laughs> Come on. Actually, for like Eric and I are very incompatible in so many ways. 
So many ways. I wish she was here because she'd be like, yep, amen. <laughs> That's actually the beauty of it. The beauty of our marriage has been formed in the incompatibility because what do we have to do? We have to work things out with each other and we've got we've to negotiate life and, and thoughts. And, and if you've ever met my wife before, it's not like she's shy. It's not like she's like, well, I'm going to hold my opinion back today. Said her never. Um, so it's a beautiful thing because then we, we contest with each other and we work with one another. That's actually the beauty of it. But so many people are jumping ship on divorce simply because I want an upgrade. I'm going to say this to the husbands in here. Yeah, her body changed. She gave birth to your children. And that was like half, like, no, that was all truth. No half joke. That's all truth. Because what did you expect of her? That's the beauty of our marriages. Those are war wounds. Those are war wounds of love. See, when you reframe it, it changes the dignity of these things. But sure, you went into marriage at 24 thinking each other was going to look the same for the rest of your entire life. Nope. Yeah, he went bald. <laughs> Got a little bit of a gut. Testosterone went down. <laughs> yup. She got cancer. Wow. You think God didn't know it? Did he bring you two together or not? Church, this is the real stuff. And to avoid it would be negligence in Scripture. My heart breaks for those who have experienced divorce at a real level because I know it because I've gone through it in my life. I'm the product of a home that was split up. And I don't say that condemning. My mom is one of the most beautiful people I know. I'm the product of a praying mom, but I know that wasn't her heart for things. Y'all see what I'm talking about? And I'm giving this treatment I'm taking length of time because I don't want us walking out of here with just these seemingly stark statements. I understand, like Paul understood with his people, there's situational nuance, but we're talking about some things here where divorce is not an option just because you want an upgrade, just because you believe that there might be somebody better out there for you. The one you have become one flesh with is the better one. Number four. Everybody look at me when I say this last point and then you can write it down in a minute. Principle number four. I mean, Jason, there's, there's a lot you just talked about. I've messed up. I've gone through some things. What about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about? Listen to four. God's grace is sufficient for our rebellion, our mistakes, our unbelief, and our lack of control. I want you to know that divorce or the situations that we've gone through are not unpardonable sins. That's not God's heart for us. But it's not like you're cloaked in this just sin that you're never going to get away from. Can I just tell you today, church, God's grace is sufficient for the worst part of our lives. God's grace is sufficient for the hardest part of our lives. God's grace is so sufficient for the darkest part of our lives. God's grace is so, so good, and it meets us right where we are at. It meets you right where you are at. He met me right where I was at. He'll find you in your darkest of spaces. His grace is sufficient. So stop using your brokenness as a reason to not approach him. Stop using your brokenness as a reason to stay away from the cross. He gave the cross on purpose. He died on the cross on purpose so that you could actually come to him in your hardest of moments knowing that his grace is sufficient for you.
Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. I submit this message to you today with a humble heart, knowing that every single one of us have experienced the effects of a lot of these things. And my prayer is that you will find grace, his sufficient grace, right where you are at in Jesus' mighty name, church. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes in this moment. Both of our rooms today, I know that there's people who are struggling and going through things, and some of these topics touch your heart, touch your life. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to single the subject out, but I would ask this question. If there's anybody in both Auditorium 1 and Auditorium 2 today where you would say, man, Jason, that one, that one was... Uh, close. It was in my neighborhood. Would you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you. Lift it up big and high. Be bold. Be, be courageous in this moment. God reaches out. The Bible says God is near to the brokenhearted. Jesus, I'm so grateful that your, your grace is sufficient for us. It's meeting us here right now in this moment. You know the situations. You know the circumstance, God, and we trust you. Lord, we trust you with our hearts. We trust you with our relationships. We trust you with our minds. We trust you with everything that we're facing. So, God, I ask right now that you would heal where healing is needed. Repair, Lord. Soften hearts. Would you do the work that only your spirit could do? In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your head just one more time, and I want to ask one more question. How, Jason, is any of this possible? How do we do these type of lives that the Bible's asserting to us? And I'll tell you, in our own right, it's not possible, but by the power of God, all things are possible. And so some of us in this room today, and I'm not sorry, too, you just simply need to welcome Jesus into your life as Lord. You got to stop running from him. You got to run to him. So we're going to pray a prayer. There's nothing powerful in the words that's saying, but the heart from which this prayer comes today, and if you'd say, man, Jason, I need to say yes to Jesus. I need to make him Lord of my life. I need his grace. I need him to be my savior. Would you pray this prayer with us today? As loud as you can. All of us are going to do it, so we don't leave anybody out. Everybody say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. My past, my right now, I'm putting my future in your hands. Save me. Change me, make me new. And I declare in this moment that I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for the sufficiency of your grace and saving me. In Jesus' mighty name.